In today's adventure of an episode, I've got a compilation for you guys. Malicious compliance. I'm going to make sure I read a new post at the beginning here as well. And yeah, it's going to be a beautiful time and I hope you're excited. Before we do start the episode though, I've got some recent cat photos to show you guys. I'm pretty sure I told you guys I bought an Xbox pretty recently and I was playing it the other night and this is how Jin was looking at me. Just a beautiful little fluffy man. And also it's summer here in Australia and it's so bloody hot. And as you can see in this photo, Jin is sick of it. And at the very very same time I took that photo, this is Nez sleeping behind Jin, looking so adorable. And she's completely asleep on the TV remote. And then finally, this is Nez asleep on the floor. So yeah, they're the recent cat photos. Enjoy the compilation, guys. I dare you. Okay, bet. A couple of years ago, I was working with a really obnoxious co-worker. He was super lazy, always complaining, extremely unmotivated to do anything actually related to his job, very motivated to mess around at any given opportunity. Anyway, this one night I was doing the big closing mop. At my store, this meant filling a bucket full of water and floor cleaner, splashing it all over the store, scrubbing with a hard brush and vacuuming everything with a wet vac. Clean, fast and effective. So I get around to the front counter and there he is, just standing in the middle of my path with a crap eating grin on his face. I'm like, bro, can you move? Nah, he says. Seriously, I need to get this done fast. Yeah, nah, he says. Dude, you don't move and I'm gonna dump water all over you. Go on then, I dare you, he says. Okay, one thing about me is I never make a threat that I'm not gonna follow through on. I immediately pour what's left in my bucket directly into his sneakers. He shrieks and jumps out of the way and he spends the next hour complaining that his socks are full of water. Well, yeah, what did you think was gonna happen, dude? OPD exactly what they said they were gonna do. Yeah, that's so frustrating. And good on you, OP, for actually doing what you were gonna say. You gotta respect the commitment. You want me to get the attention of your husband's commanding officer? It's your funeral. So, over the past few days, I've become friends with a retired army officer that I'll call Belle. She's been delighting me with stories of her service and shared this wonderful story that I think you'll enjoy. Names and some details have been changed to protect the innocent. Belle was a young second lieutenant at her first posting, as she put it. My college diploma hadn't even arrived in the mail and I was scared as hell. Fortunately, she got on the NCO's good side and settled in pretty nice. One afternoon, she was at work when in an officer's wife, quite unquote looking like she was in the mood to cause hell. Belle keeps her head down trying to stay busy when she hears the dreaded words, I'm talking to you soldier. Belle looked up and saw the woman, let's call her Karen because why not? Standing in front of her, can I help you ma'am? Belle asked, yeah I'm Major Mc I'm so important's wife and I need to speak to Colonel Stone. Do you have an appointment? He's busy. Belle asked, just go get him, I'll stand right here until you do. Belle looks around wondering what the hell she's supposed to do. She didn't want to risk her job because Colonel Stone was known around the base for having a fierce temper. I'll have you knocked back down to private if you don't do as I say, Karen shouts. Now move. Wanting to get away, Belle got up and walked towards the Colonel's office, intending to get away for a long enough coffee break that Karen will forget. When she looked back, she sees that Karen is watching her like a hawk. So there goes that plan. Colonel Stone's door is shut and Belle knocks on the door. Yes, Colonel Stone barked. Sir, it's Second Lieutenant Belle Smith, she said. Come in. Belle opens the door, does the customary salute and he immediately notices how nervous she is. What is it? Major McIm so important's wife is here and she wants to speak to you. Belle said, her voice squeaking. Does she have an appointment? She just said to get you and that she wouldn't leave until you saw her. I see. Did she threaten to knock you down to private? She did. Colonel Stone nodded and then said in a voice that scared Belle, send her in. Belle salutes and then goes back to Karen. Karen looks absolutely smug. He'll see you now, Belle said. See, now that wasn't so hard, was it? Karen said, strolling over to the Colonel's office. It's at this point that a first sergeant named Sanders comes in. He just sits down as the office door closes. He counts down in a low voice. Three, two, one. What the hell were you thinking? Colonel Stone shouted. For a good five minutes, he proceeds to tear Karen a new butthole, telling her that she isn't permitted to wear her husband's rank and that if she ever tries pulling anything like that again, her husband will be busted down to private faster than he could sneeze. Karen left the office like a bat out of hell, white as a sheet and quaking. Belle never saw her again, but she and the major got divorced shortly after. According to Belle, he realized what a liability she'd be to his career. Oh, the audacity. That's so frustrating. Like, my husband is a high rank, so that means I'm going to be awful to everybody. No, but doing stuff like this is so cringe. I'm going to boss you around and be a bad person because I'm more powerful. And I feel like when people do stuff like this, they think they look super cool. But they're just being an a-hole. The next one is called Karma is a B-Arch. And so was she. Cross-posted elsewhere. It being Christmas time reminded me of this. A story from 
quite a few years ago from when I was a bartender in a corporate style cookie cutter restaurant. I mostly work nights but I had one regular mid shift on Fridays. We were always super busy at the bar for lunch on Fridays and usually had quite a few of the more workers coming in to eat and then head back to work. Nearly every Friday the same smug borderline rude lady came in for lunch. Every time she paid exact change, zero tip and maybe half the time she would complain over some minor inconvenience and more than a few times got a comped meal. The more I had to wait on her the more indignant and pissed I got. So around Christmas time I was out and about in the mall buying for family and friends. I picked out something nice for my girlfriend at the time. A sheer top which I thought would look amazing on her. Decently priced with it being on sale too. Walking up to the cashier I was a bit surprised to run into. Resting arch face. Whatever. In street clothes I feel like she barely registered who I was. Or maybe she really didn't care who was at her register. Maybe both. So I hand her a $20 bill. She examines it for a moment. Turns it over twice. Held it up to the light even. Then out comes the counterfeit pen marker. Thinking to myself, a bit excessive, no? The change should have been around a dollar. Surprisingly, she hands out $81 plus change. She calls next in line, so I step to the side for a moment in contemplation. I could honestly feel the devil on one shoulder and the angel on the other. It took me a moment or two, but I finally let my moral compass win and I step back in front of the register. I nicely explained that there was a mistake made, but before I could even continue, she shot me down and briskly told me, in a semi-professional tone to get the hell out. So I did. The way I look at it, all those lost tips and the money she just gifted me was just karma. Suck to be her, I guess. Oh my god, that's so awesome. Could you imagine if they did this on purpose? And they're like, you know what? I feel bad about this. Here's $81 in change. Like, they definitely didn't do it on purpose, but that would be so funny. But yeah, hell yeah, that's good karma. And yeah, you did feel bad and you were like, you know what? I need to try and do the right thing here. But yeah, they were not gonna listen to you, so you pretty much had to keep it. Hell yeah, OP. The next one is called Act Like a Jerk. Paid the stupid tax way back in the late 1900s. During some of my high school years, I worked at a location of the restaurant chain prophesized in Demolition Man to one day be the victor of the fast food wars, along with several other buddies from school. In those days, one could purchase a taco in hard or soft shell form for 79 cents. Shell, meat, lettuce, cheese. If you wanted the supreme version, which added tomatoes and sour cream, it cost 99 cents. If you wanted to add sour cream to any menu item, it was a 20 five cent upcharge. Many people would come in and order a taco with sour cream added and generally we'd repeat it back as a taco supreme no tomatoes knowing that ringing it up this way saved the person five cents. Shocking life hack that most people don't know. If anybody asked we'd explain why we rung it up that way and most folks were cool about it but sometimes and sadly more frequently than one would hope for you'd have the jerks who just couldn't comprehend things like logic. That's not what I ordered etc. Nowadays I believe they would be called Karens. Back then we just called them C words when we encountered those people. It wasn't worth my barely minimum wage to try to explain things like economics or basic math to people way above my pay grade. So we'd just say sorry about that, I'll correct it and then ring it up exactly how they ordered widely known as the stupid tax. Yeah, it's entirely petty and mostly insignificant when it was only 5 cents per taco. But we were teenagers working part time at a taco bell. What do you expect? Wow, that's so interesting. Like, oh, that's not what I ordered. Yeah, you're saving me money and I don't even realize it, but I'm gonna be rude for no reason. I feel like you did the right thing, OP. The next one is called Just Fix the Truck. On my first enlistment in the army, I was a mechanic. In our unit, we had three staff sergeants for some reason. Sergeant T was on the last year of his contract and would be retiring. He was assigned as the motor supply sergeant, a position that was made up so he could ride the pine since we were overstaffed. Sergeant G was assigned as the maintenance supervisor and oversaw the preventative maintenance and repair of the vehicles in the motor pool. The third one was our platoon sergeant and doesn't feature in the story. Every Monday, the vehicle operators will come to the motor pool to perform their weekly vehicle inspections. The mechanics would affect any repairs that were possible at the time, like changing out burnt bulbs, stuff that was easy and could get the vehicle rolling. Then we begin performing repairs to any vehicle that had a deadline deficiency, a deficiency that needs to be repaired before the vehicle can be operated. These don't necessarily mean the vehicle isn't operational, just that operating the vehicle in that condition can cause greater problems, and then we'd fix the rest. Usually on Friday, we'd order any parts that we needed to repair that was left. After the operators left on Monday, the inspection sheets were divided up between the mechanics and then we got to work. One week I had a fairly easy workload and I got all of my sheets finished by Wednesday. There was only one vehicle that had a deadline deficiency left and the rest were ordering parts. The vehicle in question had been taken by the operators every day. I called the unit to let them know that the vehicle had a deadline deficiency and it needed to return to the motor pool. They were short on vehicles and long on work and had been stalling. So I informed my squad leader and I left it at that. I went to the office and I began
began ordering parts. When my work was completed, I would assist other mechanics with theirs. Sergeant G walks in and asks me why I was in the office, and I informed him that the rest of my work was complete and I was ordering parts. He asked to see my inspection sheets and started looking through them. I tried to explain about the one vehicle, but he cut me off and said that he'd see what the paper said. He saw the deadline deficiency and ordered me out to repair that vehicle immediately. I tried to object and explain the situation, but he cut me off again and ordered me to go out and fix the vehicle. I tried a third time to explain, and again he cuts me off and says, I don't want your effing excuses. I want your ass out on the line fixing that effing truck. If I see you doing anything else before it is fixed, it'll be an Article 15. An Article 15 is non-judicial punishment and can result in reduction of rank or forfeiture of pay. Yeah, roger, Sarge, I'm on it. I walked to the rack of manuals for the vehicles, pulled the appropriate one, and I found the size of the bolts on the part that needed changed. I got my wrenches and I head out to the assigned spot for the vehicle. I lay down right there, I raise my tools, and I began making wrenching motions with my arms. I did this for over an hour with some breaks, of course. Those were some giant wrenches. I saw people looking at me and pointing. Eventually, somebody went to Sergeant T and told him what I was doing, and he comes over to check it out. He watches me wrenching for a minute or two, head cocked. What are you doing, squirrel? Fixing this truck, Sergeant. It's got a deadline. He was looking at me real funny now, like I had heat stroke or something. Squirrel, you do realize that the truck ain't here, right? Sarge, I know this and you know this, but Sergeant G doesn't want to hear my effing excuses. He wants my ass out on the line fixing this effing truck. Sergeant T told me to get up and get back to work. I told him that G threatened an Article 15 and he said that he'd take care of it. I took a smoke break to give them time to resolve the issue before I went back to the office. I'm not sure what Sergeant T said, but G had a scowl on his face when I came back to order my parts. I can't get enough of reading this subreddit. I'm so glad you guys enjoy these episodes because they're so fun to make. You, a senior citizen military veteran, can handle my hyperactive seven-year-old. Be my guest. This happened years ago with myself and a friend and my then boyfriend and his daughter. We couldn't do much for toys for this particular Christmas, but our family was nominated for an event called Shop with a Veteran. It's where kids go in a Walmart with a veteran and can pick out their own Christmas gifts with a set amount of money donated by civilians and other veterans. The thing is, only the veteran can go with them. I'd later found out that it was because some parents had earlier tried to persuade their kids to get things that were more catered to the parents or another child instead of the child who was nominated. I can definitely understand the rule for this, but some children should have their parents with them. My boyfriend's daughter was diagnosed with pretty severe ADHD and had taken her medication, but she'd gotten very excited when she found out about going to get Christmas gifts of her choosing. We found the lady hosting and we explained to her about the daughter's ADHD and how she can be a whirlwind when she gets excited and also how she doesn't like to listen to people that she doesn't know. When we explained to the lady hosting the event that one of us should go in with his daughter just to make sure that she behaved, she understood and talked to the veteran who was going to shop with the daughter. He immediately argued, claiming he was tired of parents wanting to pressure their kids to get something that they didn't want and he wanted the daughter to have a good time picking out her gift. The lady tried to explain the situation but the veteran wouldn't hear any of it. I clearly remember him grumbling at us. I've been to war, I can handle a kid. Well, in that case, after the veteran took the daughter into the store, we saw two friends going in that we didn't know would be there, but we were happy to see them. My boyfriend caught up with them and asked one of them if they could keep an eye on the daughter and the veteran. My boyfriend then emphasized that the veteran clearly thought he could handle his daughter, so let him handle her. We waited for about an hour when the veteran returned with the daughter. She was grinning ear to ear at all the presents she was able to get. The veteran looked exhausted and like he'd been through hell. He then yelled at us that the daughter was the most disrespectful brat that he'd ever met, how she had to touch all the toys and throw everything she wanted into the shopping cart, and she was a nightmare when he told her that she couldn't have everything she picked out. My boyfriend packed his daughter's gifts in the car and then took her back inside to start our grocery shopping. We couldn't do it while she was in there with the veteran because we had to wait outside for when they were done, so we could immediately take her and her gifts. Understandable, they weren't babysitters. I decided to talk to the veteran and I told my boyfriend that I'd meet him inside. I asked him if he was okay. He said he was fine. But why didn't we tell him that our daughter was crazy? I corrected him by saying that she was not crazy. I explained her ADHD to him and how we only wanted to go in with them so she would behave. We know that she knows how to behave around us and school and grandma's house, how she doesn't like to listen to strangers, even if we know them and she doesn't. I apologized and I told him that not all parents want to go in to use this as an excuse to get their own gifts. Some genuinely just want to make sure that their kids behave. Later in the store, our friend caught up with us and told us everything that happened. The daughter had run up and down the toy aisle. She kept going back and forth from the toys to the cart, throwing in anything she could get her hands on. She even screamed at the veteran when he put some of the toys back. Typical behavior when her normal authority figures aren't watching. When she was satisfied with the toys that she did get, she kept on asking for candy at the checkout, which she asked anybody 
24 when we go to the store. It was amusing to us that a grizzled military veteran was outmatched by a hyperactive 7 year old. We've since then been better off and we donate money to this event every year and even toys for any toy drive they have. The veteran still does the event but he's more understanding when certain children need their parents to go with them. He does get the old pushy parent now and then but he handles them rather than flat out denies that all parents go in. Yeah like this comment says, I've never been to war but I have been around plenty of kids. Neither experience prepares you for the other. Yeah like oh well, I've been to war so I can handle this. I don't feel like they're comparable experiences are they? Like yeah I get what they were trying to say but it sounds like they definitely got a surprise with this. Upload everything to SharePoint. You got it. A number of years back I worked for a company that was on a company wide migration of most office documents to SharePoint. It worked great for things like shared documents or sheets or contracts but our department was working with large data sets. You can see where this is going. One day the project manager of one of the projects I was on asked me via email to upload everything I had on the project to SharePoint. This is a real pain because there's tons of files and I'd rather not. Everything? Are you absolutely sure? There's a lot. He was sure. He wanted everything so everything is what he got. Many thousands of data files, terabytes worth of stuff. I get a frantic call from IT. It wasn't meant for this. I tell him to talk to the project manager. They ask me why and I just forward his email with the instructions to upload everything. Minutes later a company wide email goes out saying that SharePoint is for documents and spreadsheets only. Yeah like the top comment says, it's always the project manager. Just do what I told you. And then it all goes sideways. Been a few since I worked with SharePoint. Not missing it at all. What's that project manager you want everything? Yeah okay. The next one is called manager kept on forgetting my break. I worked in a cafeteria on campus at my university. It was wonderful because I could take shifts around lectures and I didn't lose any time traveling. The manager used to sit in her office on the phone or just disappear for long periods of time. I didn't mind because I like my other co-workers and she left us alone to do our thing. I always volunteered to do the closing shift because the owner let me take home all the leftover food. It pretty much kept me and my housemates alive and we were very grateful. The problem was on a 5 hour or longer shift you had to take a 30 minute break. I'd always ask when mine was but she'd always say later. We're too busy. I'd usually end up working the whole 5 hours. I didn't mind until I realised she was only paying me for 4 and a half. I asked her about it and she said that if I didn't take my breaks that wasn't her problem. Oh the audacity. This absolutely is your problem. You're the one saying to not take their breaks. Yeah cue the malicious compliance. My next closing shift was four and a half hours of opening hours and finished 30 minutes after closing. Everyone else went at seven but I stayed back to myself to clean everything in 30 minutes. It was a big job but I had it down pat. The entire shift I kept asking her if I could take my break and she kept on saying no. So at seven I took my apron off and I walked out saying that I'll be taking my break now since we were too busy before. I sat in the cafeteria and I watched her clean that entire place. It took her well over an hour. The next day she had a break schedule up. Yeah good on you OP. That bit where they said if you didn't take your breaks that wasn't her problem. God that's so annoying. And like the top comment says I love this but you should still do something about the wage theft. That's very serious. Okay I feel like we should read one more for today. The boss wants me to stand in the corner. Okay. Years ago I was a photographer at a major theme park and I work with the characters on an almost daily basis. Our famous character is a mouse that owns the whole park. Everyone who worked there either referred to him as boss or Mr. Mouse around guests. For the purposes of this post I'll refer to him as boss. One morning I was assigned to work with the boss. He was in a mischievous mood and being an overall goofball. I enjoyed this and so did our guests and the character attendants. One of his favourite things to do when he was in a mischievous mood was to try to pass me the autograph books he'd signed. Conveniently ignoring the fact that I had my hands full with a camera. As I went to take them he'd drop them and run away making a laughing motion. So we're with this family and boss does his usual pass the autograph books to the photographer stand. He holds them out expectantly and I said I'd love to boss but you know I don't know my ABCs. At this point the boss drops the books, takes my hand, moves me to a corner and points to the floor telling me to stay like I was a naughty child. Malicious compliance mode activated. Okay I guess I'm grounded I said pouting. Everyone at this point is howling with laughter. Even our head manager Diane who had stepped in to watch. So boss continues his interaction with the family. Now at the end of the session we have the family pose with the character. So boss gets everybody together and poses with the popular ta-da. Except there's no photographer. After a moment the boss motions to the family to wait and stomps over to my corner. I'm fighting back a grin at this point as he turns me around, points to my camera and then held his hands up as if to say, what gives? Boss you told me I'm grounded remember? I said with a sweet innocent smile. It's at this point that Diane pipes up with, that you did Mr. Mouse. Boss playfully drags me back to my spot and poses again. We get 
get the photo and we send the family on their way. Diane stepped out with them and offered to send them through again to get more pictures because I didn't take many on account of me being grounded. The family accepted, although the dad, who had tears in his eyes at this point, said it was the hardest he's laughed in a long time. To this day, it still brings a smile to my face. Oh, so we're ending the episode on a wholesome post. Thank you for posting this OP. That was so good. None requires a haircut every week or gets expelled. Sure thing. This is my husband's story from high school. Let's call him Phil. Phil attended a private Catholic school from kindergarten through to graduation. He was and still is a long haired hippie. All was well until his senior year when a nun became principal. She was offended by this boy's long hair. She was also warned by some of the other teachers, nuns, not to get into it with him because no doubt he will win. Phil and his dad meet with the principal and offer a solution of wearing a wig so he doesn't have to cut his hair. The nun says, no way. What if other kids decide to do that? No, the nun insists that he get his hair cut or he's going to be expelled. Father says, okay, he'll get his hair cut every week and we'll provide the receipts. Will that suffice? The nun agrees. Cue the malicious compliance. Phil's dad takes him to the beauty shop. Says, cut as little as humanly possible off his hair. The hairdresser is all, why not just have me provide a receipt and not cut it? Well, that wouldn't fly because they're going to be totally honest about the whole thing. A cut every week with a receipt. The hairdresser provides proceeds to do a haircut every week, just a trim mind you, and does provide a receipt. The nun has no recourse. Phil graduates with longer and healthier hair than what he started the year with. Wow, that's so funny. Like, yeah, okay, I'll cut my hair, but you didn't say how much. <laughs> that was a super wholesome post. And also, that was bloody awesome of the dad too. Like, that sounds like a super supportive dad. I need 100 sales to reach top rated seller status, regardless of what they are. Got it. I resell on eBay. At the time, I had a around 75 sales worth over six grand. The eBay requirements for a top rated seller are a thousand dollars in sales, but it also requires a hundred sales. So I decided to cheese the system. I went to my bank and I withdrew $50 in $2 bills and listed them for 99 cents plus whatever the cost of a stamp was. They all sold within two days. And when I was evaluated next month, I was a top rated seller. And after fees, I only lost around $35 and I got to deduct the loss off my taxes. I've made way more than $35 from being a top rated seller in the time scenes. Wow, that's so interesting. And also smart, surely. And yeah, good on you for doing that, OP. There's probably so many top-rated sellers that shouldn't be, especially if they're the requirements. The next one is called Packing. Details matter. When we were packing, I numbered all the boxes and I used color-coded labels for each. And I had a running inventory sheet for each box. I packed the entire house by myself. Well, the kids did help with their toys. My husband didn't do the garage until I forced him to. I kept asking him what's in the box so I could list a number it so we knew what was in it and he lost his patience and said there are wrenches and screwdrivers and crap like that dear he does this for multiple boxes saying stuff like it doesn't matter it just needs to be packed and never mind the list the movers are going to be here soon so i dutifully write this down and cue the malicious non-compliance fast forward and we're moved into and renovating the new house we are beyond stressed because there are birders and wallpaper that were applied by satan which delayed the painting which delayed the carpet and so on hubby's looking for a specific tool, asking me what's in a specific numbered box. I can give him specific details, but I tell him that's orange, which is kitchen. You need blue, which is the garage. So he goes over to the boxes labeled in blue with the garage stuff in it. There's a pretty big pile. He knows that I can find the stuff in the boxes that I packed and ask which box has the tool that he wants in it. I tell him that he didn't give me a lot of detail. He points to a box and tells me to read out what's in the box. I read out wrenches, screwdrivers, and crap like that, dear. He gets a little annoyed and asked about the next one. I say, it doesn't matter. It just needs to be packed. I handed him my log and I just told him that's what he gets for not cooperating. He had to go through about 20 boxes to find the right one. Oh my God, OP, that's so funny. You gave it straight back to him. That's hilarious. Like maybe it was a good idea and maybe it does matter what's in the boxes now. Hell yeah, OP. A customer wanted the foam head or crown of his beer at the bottom. So when my dad was younger, he worked in a bar in Germany that made their own beer as a beer tapper. One time a customer came up to the counter and chokingly ordered a beer with the foam head at the bottom of his beer. So my father took a glass, filled it to the top with a nice foam head crown. I don't know the right term. Put a beer mat on top of it, quickly flipped the glass 180 degrees and then pushed it towards the customer. The customer tipped him 20 bucks and then went back to his buddies with the flip beer. Oh, that's so cute. Another wholesome one. Your dad sounds like an absolute champion. That's so cute. Like, yeah, buddy, I can do it at the bottom. No problemo, okay? The next 
next one is called she wants a decorated house. She's gonna get a decorated house. Merry late Christmas. My friends Adam and Bill have a story about one of their neighbors and how he managed to stuff a five pound bag of coal into a Karen stocking this Christmas by using malicious compliance. This particular neighbor, Tim, and his wife Frances would go overboard on the outdoor decorations every Christmas. There'd be lights, garlands, iron reindeer statues, snow flags, candy canes, a six foot tall Santa statue, a nativity set, etc, etc. It was quite unquote its own brand of charm, according to the neighbors. Unfortunately, earlier this year, Frances suffered a massive stroke and passed away. Oh, that's awful. Tim was devastated, especially as Christmas came closer and closer. Frances' favorite holiday was Christmas. Tim told the neighbors around Thanksgiving that he wasn't going to decorate the house that year. It was just too painful without Frances there. Everyone was sad, but they understood. Unfortunately, Karen didn't get this memo. It's the week or so after Thanksgiving and people who haven't put up Christmas decorations are busy doing so. Adam and Belle were walking their dog Domingo. Tim is at the front of his house getting the mail. Adam and Belle go up with Domingo to see Tom and say hello. While they're talking, a red minivan pulls into Tim's driveway. Karen steps out. Belle and Adam have never seen her before, but Tim recognizes her. Good morning, Karen. Yeah, hi. Uh, I was wondering if you were going to put up your Christmas decorations this year. Adam, Belle and Tim look at each other uncomfortable. I'm not going to put up any decorations this year, Tim said. And why not? Karen asked. Christmas reminds me of Frances. Well, what about my kids? They've been looking forward to seeing the house decorated. And the fact that you're pretty much the only house that isn't decorated makes them really sad. What would Frances want? Oh my god, how awful can people be? Belle, Adam and Tim just stared in astonishment. We've had a pandemic and we need the cheering. They've been looking forward to this every year. Tim is looking both angry and broken hearted. Adam and Belle are ready to tell Karen to go and stuff it. But Karen sets the trap for Tim's malicious compliance. We're going to be here after church on Christmas Eve and the house better be decorated. And with that, Karen gets back into her minivan and drives off. Belle looks at Tim and he's got a malicious smile on his face. She wants a decorated house. She's going to get a decorated house. The week's past and Tim starts getting several packages delivered. He also starts putting things up in the yard, but they're covered with bed sheets, so they look like Halloween ghosts. He also starts putting lights on the house. There's more lights than usual, but he doesn't turn them on at night. Karen and her minivan don't show up. Even though Adam and Belle had alerted everybody in the neighborhood about her, Christmas Eve rolls around. Adam and Belle are invited to Tim's house for dinner and to watch the movie Scrooge. They're also asked to BYOB. When they arrive, the curtains are drawn. Tim greets them with a big smile. They settle down and he details his plan, asking for their help. They're laughing at the end of it and they eagerly agree. As they work, Belle notes that he's happier than they've seen him in a while. Tim says, it's hopefully gonna get even better. By this point, it's still just light enough that they can see what they're doing, but just dark enough that you can't see what's in the yard. They remove the bed sheets and laugh at all the decorations that have been set up. There's a nice dinner and they watch the movie. Midway through the movie, Tim's alarm goes off on his cell phone. He pauses the movie, looks at Adam and Belle and says, it's showtime. Everybody bundles up on their head to the sidewalk across the street. It's now pitch black and Tim's house still isn't lit up. There's the usual cars driving through the neighborhood with Karen's red minivan being at the end of the line. Right on time, Tim says, taking a remote out of his coat pocket. They wait until the red minivan reaches the front. Tim presses the button. And according to Belle, it was like the scene at a Christmas vacation when the Griswold's house turns on. There's red, white, and blue lights galore. The yard has eagle statues, stars and flags and banners, statues of liberty, etc. In the windows are lights that look like explosions fireworks. Tim grins and presses another button. All of a sudden, Star Spangled Banner begins to belt out through several speakers placed in the yard. Adam, Bell, and Tim are laughing as the minivan stops and parks. Karen gets out of the driver's seat and storms over to them. She shrieks, pointing to the house and looking about ready to blow a gasket. It's my salute to all nations, but mostly America, Tim said. Don't you like it? It's Christmas, Karen shouts. I wanted you to decorate the house for Christmas. You wanted a decorated house, Karen. You didn't say what holiday. And with that, Karen flipped them off and got back in the minivan and drove off. Tim turned off the music and lights and they headed back to Tim's house to finish Scrooge. Tim told Adam and Belle as they were leaving for the night, I think I'm going to decorate my house like this every Christmas. Francis would have gotten a kick out of it. But Karen sounded absolutely awful. And yeah, like this comment says, I was hoping for a big display of lights that spelt out F you Karen. Yeah, that's what I thought was going to happen. Like, yeah, here are some lights, Karen. My eight-year-old just malicious complianced me. I'm tired of seeing her clothes all over her floor when she has a laundry basket right there in her room. So I went off on it and I told her to get all her dirty clothes off the floor and into the laundry. I go about doing some other things and I come back and there are still some towels and socks on the floor. So I tell her to get those too. She says, I didn't know you meant towels. I say, get everything that is washed
washable off your floor and into the laundry. I come back up 20 minutes later and every stuffed animal and sheet along with the towels are all in the laundry because in her words, you said everything washable. Edit, I want to point out that while this is malicious compliance, she did it with a smile and there was no yelling or anything. It was a moment of you got me from me and she knew exactly what she was doing and gave me a smile and took the stuffies out without much asking. It was all in good fun on her part. I'm so happy that some of these have been super wholesome. I feel like we need that with the stuff we've been reading. And yeah, that's so funny. The next one is called You Need to Leave My Car Alone. If you say so. This is not my story, but my friend Adam's. Adam's a retired police officer and this takes place back in the mid 90s. Back when Adam was a beat cop, maybe a year or two into his service. At the time this story takes place, a firebug had targeted several businesses over the course of a three month period. The fires were put out, but they were getting bigger and bigger, causing thousands of dollars in damage. Everybody was on edge and the police were patrolling the area every single night, so maybe they could catch Mr. Firebug. On this particular night in the middle of February, Adam and his partner Rick drew the short stick and thus were assigned to patrol part of the area. While on patrol, he notices a classic Mercedes-Benz pulling up to a house and a familiar lady dressed in a thick fur coat steps out. He groans. It's the wife of a local business owner that every officer in this town has had the displeasure to ticket for various parking and traffic violations. It would have been fine if she were a nice lady or something, but no. Her three default sentences were, don't you know who I am? Where's your manager or supervisor? And I'll have your job. Seriously, she was a Karen before Karens were even a thing. Rick points out to Adam that Karen had parked right by a fire hydrant, par for the course. Adam gets ready and steps out of the squad car. Good evening, Mrs. Entitled Madam, Adam said. What are you doing here? Karen bellowed. Adam guessed that was the Karen version of the word hello. Working the beat. Do you know that you parked next to a fire hydrant? So, Karen said. I'm suggesting you move it before I write you a ticket. I'm not in the mood for extra paperwork tonight. Listen, you need to leave my car alone or I'll have your job. And with that, Karen storms off to the house, goes inside and slams the door. Adam thought, if you say so, and proceeded to check the outside of the car for any more violations and wishing that being a arch was a federal offence. As he's putting the ticket under the windshield wiper, the call that everybody's been dreading comes on the radio. A fire alarm has been triggered. The address, right across the street. Adam looks over at the building and can see a faint orange glow in the windows on the second floor. He reports the glow. He and Rick get ready in case Mr. Firebug decides to cross their path. Several officers arrive and set a perimeter around the building as the glow gets brighter and brighter. Unfortunately, by the time that the fire department gets there, flashover happens and all the windows on the second floor get blown out. It was so hot that Adam felt sweat form on his face. The fire department need to get the hoses set up, but Karen's car is in the way. Using safety hammers, they break the windows and they run the hoses through getting everything set up in record time. During all of the chaos, Karen comes out and she sounds like a banshee that had swallowed an air raid siren. She runs over and tries unhooking the hose from the hydrant. What are you doing? My car is ruined. It took two officers to restrain her and bark at her to go inside and let everybody do their job. She actually listened and returned inside. Adam spent the rest of his shift helping the fire and investigation. It was pretty close to dawn when he returned to the station to finish up. All he wanted was to go home and crawl into bed. That's when his supervisor calls Rick and him over and reports that Karen reported several thousand dollars worth of damage. Not only had her windows broken, but water had gotten in and froze because it was, again, the middle of February. The supervisor asked them what had happened, and they reported everything. Fortunately, the dash cam caught a recording of the event. The supervisor shook her head, laughed, and said, Well, you had nothing to do with the car getting damaged, so I consider this closed. A few weeks later, they caught the firebug, a different business owner who was trying to commit insurance fraud. He figured that if several other buildings caught on fire, nobody would think he was responsible responsible for burning down his own business. Unfortunately, Karen never did seem to learn her lesson, so she was back racking up tickets and being a thorn in the police's side. She did have to pay for the damages and the ticket that Adam gave her. Oh my god, that was so fun. Not that you had to deal with this or any of the fires and stuff, of course, but that was so satisfying with the Karen. Hell yeah, it's been a really fun episode. The next one is called, what are you gonna do about it? Call the cops. I was explaining to my mum what malicious compliance was and she reminded me of this story. I was a senior in high school when all of a sudden I got sick at school and I had to be sent home. Because my car was in the shop, mum had to come and get me. It's about 9.30am when this happened. As we're driving up a very busy street, we see two 7 to 8 year old kids, we'll call them Frank and Zelda, trying to cross the road. Worried, mum pulls over to see what's going on. The conversation went roughly as follows. Mum, kids, are you guys okay? What are you doing here? Frank, Dr. Idiot said that we couldn't come to school early so he sent us home. Now, mum is very familiar with Dr. Idiot he was the principal at the elementary school my younger brother was
was attending at the time. My brother Mark was going through some behavioural issues at the time and mum was commonly called to the office to the point that they were on first name basis. Not that he allowed her to use his first name because I have a doctorate in education. So it's doctor idiot. So in other words, he was an entitled idiot. There was a gas station 10 feet away. So mum tells Frank and Zelda to meet us there. We pulled in, got some water for the kids as it was a hot day. And mum calls Dr. Idiot cell phone. Again, the conversation went roughly as follows. Idiot, this is Dr. Idiot. Mum, hi, this is Mark's mum. I've got two kids here named Frank and Zelda and they say that they were sent home early. Idiot, yes, their parents dropped them off at 6am because they had to work. Something about mandatory overtime. Of course, we're not a daycare, so I just told the kids to go home and wait for the bus. Mum, are you kidding me? We're five miles away from the school. They walked all of that way. It's a wonder they weren't hit by a car or kidnapped. Idiot, what are you going to do about it? Call the cops. And then they hung up. Mum was absolutely flawed, but she decided to give Dr. Idiot a nice dose of reality. At the time, we lived in a small town. How small? So small that sometimes the chief of police would have to walk the beat. And that day, he happened to be a block or so away from the gas station. When he got the call, he arrived, got the whole story from not only Frank and Zelda, but from mum and me. And being a father of two elementary age kids himself, he was pissed. He looked at mum and said, it's time I had some words with Dr. Idiot. The chief of police drove Frank and Zelda to school in the squad car, which they were super excited about, personally escorted them to their class and then marched to Dr. Idiot's office, proceeding to tear him a new butthole, telling Dr. Idiot that he'd helped the parents press charges on him for child endangerment, among other things. And from that day on, Dr. Idiot allowed Frank and Zelda to be at school early on the days their parents had mandatory overtime. Update, so I got some details from mum about why Frank and Zelda were just dropped off at school. Their aunt works at the elementary school and had agreed to watch them until school started a couple of hours later. She wasn't on the clock. Frank and Zelda didn't live in a good part of town and their parents, understandably, didn't feel that their kids would be safe if they were alone. If Dr. Idiot had have driven them home to wait for the bus, it wouldn't have gotten on the chief of police's nerves. Update number two, as for why the aunt didn't see the kids, the parents dropped the kids off 10 minutes before the aunt arrived and Dr. Idiot assured them that he'd watch the kids for 10 minutes. Once they were gone, he told the kids to scram. When the aunt got there, she came in a different direction so she didn't see them. He told her that the kids had been dropped off since they were at work. The workplace was super anal about cell phone usage. She had no way to reach them to confirm that. She had no clue what really happened until the chief of police turned up with the kids in tow. And yeah, I have no idea how Dr. Idiot kept his job. Wow, that was incredible. And good on you, OP, for actually calling the police. Yeah, like the top comment says, beautiful malicious compliance. It's always funny to me when somebody does something crappy and casually suggests that the other party called the cops. It's like they think that surely nobody would ever dare to do such a thing. Yeah, that's right. And I'm so happy you did, OP. They a million percent deserved it. Manager told me to call the person of the computer that I was working on. So I did. Cross-posted from tech support. I was sitting in my office one slow day and the CEO walked in. Always a pucker moment, even though I'm on very good terms with him. And he handed me an obviously non-business laptop and asked if I could get it back up and running as it had very important thing on it that was needed shortly. And as I wasn't doing anything and he still signed my paycheck, I said, you got it, sir. Later, a middle mangler comes in and asks me to do something. And I say, you're number two in line and pointed to the obviously not corporate laptop I was fixing. Mangler didn't like that much and demanded I call whoever and told them that it wasn't acceptable for me to be working on personal equipment. So I pulled out my cell and I called. Mangler could only hear my half of the conversation, but what he heard was something like this. Hey Tom, I got Bob here telling me that it isn't acceptable for me to be working on your personal stuff. And he wanted me to call you and tell you. Oh yeah, sure. He's right here. Hang on. And I handed the phone to Mangler. Mangler started off by saying it's not acceptable. And then his eyes got real big and the rest of the conversation was yes sir and no sir. He hung up and thundered, why didn't you tell me it was the CEO's laptop? And I said, you didn't give me a chance and demanded I call them right now. Yeah, like, come on, buddy. I'm doing what you told me to do. What do you want out of me? I'm doing what you said. I love this one because it's relatively harmless and also funny at the same time. And also, I love how they say mangler instead of manager. Like, yeah, you're not actually managing anything. You're mangling it. It's a beautiful subreddit, isn't it? The next one is called, you don't want me to work after I put in my two weeks, okay? So, when I was in my early 20s, I worked at a well-known sandwich franchise. I actually really liked my job and I would open and close. I'd also come in when anybody called out because I lived about five minutes away. One day, my boss hires a new person, no big deal, except my boss kept cutting my hours more and more and giving them to the new person. I went from working 30 plus hours a week to working less than 15. Oh, and I was training them. So after a few months, 
of my hours getting cut, but me still coming in whenever cold, I put in my two weeks. My boss proceeded to not schedule me a single hour after that. Cue the malicious compliance. One of my co-workers who would call on the regular didn't come in to open the store at 6am. I drove by at 11 and it was still dark. My old boss had called me to ask if I could open for her. Nope, you didn't want to give me any hours after I put in my two weeks. Figure it out. Well, I drove by that store for a couple of weeks and wouldn't you know, it was only open half the time. Wow, that sucks. They bring in a new person and then start cutting your hours without even talking to you about it. And also to rub it in your face, it's the person that you're training. That's such an a-hole move. But yeah, good on your OP. They don't deserve you. And I'm sure you're doing something a lot better now. And like the top comment says, if an employer can fire you without any notice, you can quit without any notice. The next one is called The New Fence. Recalling this story made my heart smile. A few years ago, I was building a new fence for a friend of mine. I had to remove the old sections that were falling apart first, of course. And when I got to the intersection of his back fence, his side fence, and the next door neighbor's back fence, I carefully separated the neighbor's fence from his, and I proceeded to carry on removing the side sections that went between the two properties. My friend had told me that the side section was 100% on his property, and that the previous owner, 30 plus years ago, had deliberately given the next door neighbor's property an extra foot or so to ensure he was building on his own property without calling for and paying for a survey. The neighbor Susan, who I'll refer to as Karen for the remainder of the story, came running outside screaming at me that I couldn't remove the side fence and it was their property. And just what do I think I'm doing? That my friend had told them well in advance that he was going to replace the fence, that he was just going to build it in the same place as the old one, and asked if they were willing to split the cost, to which they declined. No biggie. Karen started screaming at me again, telling me that I had no right to do that, and that my friend didn't give them proper notice, and that she didn't realize that there wouldn't be anything between their two properties to contain their dog. By now, I'm about ready to lose my crap, so I knocked on my friend's back door to let him know what was going on, and that he needed to talk to Karen, and that I was leaving because I didn't want to do or say anything I'd regret, or cause any problems with the neighbors for my friend. The entire project got put on hold, pending a property survey that was going to cost $650, and that they demanded my friend pay half of, despite him telling them that the fence was definitely on his property, and nothing was going to change with the new fence, and that he was fine with them continuing to have like a foot or so of his property so that he didn't have to rock the boat. Fast forward to the following Monday when the surveyor comes out. Turns out the old side fence was not a little on my friend's property, but almost 10 feet onto his property. And the neighbors had built up raised flower beds and done a nice brick retaining wall right up along the fence line. That spent a lot of money on that just in materials, never mind the time they put in constructing it. Needless to say that my friend came away with the biggest crap eating grin for the mere price of $325. He was entitled to expand his yard of more than 30 years by about 800 square feet and Karen and her husband who happened to be the polar opposite of his wife in personality and was super nice spent the next week moving their garden retaining wall and all the dirt that was on my friend's property so that I could build the fence on his side of the actual property line they then hired the cheapest contractors they could find to slap up a fence on their side of the property they spent almost as much as my friend did on their new fence I gave my friends and family discount three years later the last 20 feet or so of their fence is on the ground already because it was such a crappy job that it fell over in a moderate windstorm this past spring. My friend's fence is still standing rock solid and his dogs are definitely making good use of the extra 800 square feet. Oh, that was so fun to read and so similar to the pro revenge and the petty revenge with how satisfying these are. But yeah, that's so wild. They get so upset. They'd be super rude. They get a surveyor out there and they lose so much more of their yard. Yeah, that was so good. The next one is called I got rid of them boss just like you asked. Short and simple one today. This took place where I work at a funeral home. We had several sets of straps for our lowering device, the thing that slowly lowers the coffin into the ground, and orders came from one of the managers to get rid of all the sets we had as new ones were coming in. I tried to protest that the new ones had arrived and were already in rotation, but was ignored. Gather up all the straps and get rid of them. Sir, yes sir. Initially, I was instructed to throw them out, but I asked to keep them instead. I was told they had to leave the premises one way or the other, so I took them and I gave them to a friend of mine for safekeeping. A month later, I have the same manager come up to me asking how many sets of straps we have. I reply and say none. He asks about the new ones that had come in. I inform him that they left the premises a month prior. As per his instructions, he flies into a panic and is about to berate me for throwing them out when I tell him to relax. I can bring them back in. I bring them back in the next day. No harm and no foul. Certainly bruised that manager's ego a bit and made him think about what he says next time though. Yeah, like the top comment says, don't forget to ask for things in writing always, especially when it's a dumb decision.
decision. And OP responds, I had one of the other senior managers there when he made the initial declaration. When I did this, I told him exactly what I was doing and he supported me 100%. Yeah, well, let's hope he doesn't do something like this again. The next one is called, sorry, you told me to leave you alone. When I was around 15 or 16, a friend and I went to the local mall on the weekend to hang out and hit the arcade. After a bit, we decided to get a drink at the food court. While we were standing in line, an older man, late 30s or early 40s, looking like he just got out of the gym, decided to cut in line in front of us. The line was fairly long at this point, around 10 deep. They had the best lemonade in the mall. I tapped him on the shoulder and said, Sir, we're in line here. He shot us a look and turned back around, pretty much ignoring the fact that we were there. When he got nearer to the register, he reached into his pocket to take out his wallet. As he did so, a wad of cash fell onto the floor unnoticed by him. As rude as he was, I was raised to be courteous and respectful. I picked up the cash and said, Excuse me, sir. At which point he replied without even turning to look at me, Shut up and leave me the hell alone. I turned back to look at the older gentleman behind us who just smiled and shrugged. So I placed the cash in my pocket. When it was time for him to pay, he opened his wallet to discover that there was no cash in it. He quickly turned and scanned the floor. When he didn't find the money, he asked us if we'd seen him drop it. My friend said, Can't help you, we were told to shut up and leave you the hell alone. He was a bit spicy. He ranted, but in the end he walked away without his money. Turned out there was 147 bucks in there. A nice haul for a broke kid in the early 90s. Another time when I was just a little bit older, I'd gone to Wally World. I purchased something fairly inexpensive and I paid the cashier. She handed me back around $87 in change. I said, ma'am, I think you gave me the wrong change. She looked at it and told me that she had it right. I responded, but ma'am, she cut me off, spitting mad and went into a rant about how she was very good at math. I let her finish and simply said, okay, sorry to bother you, ma'am. I then took my leave. I wonder how she felt about her math skills when she counted her draw after her shift. What I was trying to tell her was that I'd paid with a 20, not a Benjamin. Wow, so you paid with a $20 note and you got $87 in change? Yeah, wow, that's a wonderful accident. Like, well, if you insist, if you really want me to leave, I will. But the guy that cut in line and told them to shut up and leave them the hell alone, they deserve to lose their money, being so bloody awful to people for no reason, and they cut the line in front of you, and they have the audacity to get upset at you. That's so frustrating, but it had a satisfying ending. My chair doesn't meet health and safety. It's war. I'm a teacher. I made a cool desk chair out of a car seat and the base of the old one that was falling apart. I used hardware I had laying around, so it cost almost nothing. My custom chair was super comfy, ergonomic, fully adjustable, lumbar support, and better than the piece of crap I had before. Also, environmentally friendly, reduce, reuse, and recycle. Anyway, my tool of a principal says it one day, murmur something about how unusual that looks. A few weeks later, she comes around saying that it isn't health and safety compliant. I have to get rid of it, and they'll order a brand new one. Okay, fine, I'm getting a new chair. New one arrives, and it's another cheap one that only has height adjustment and nothing else. Probably fall apart in a couple of years, so not health and safety compliant. I called the HR department, and I asked them to do a workplace evaluation. They came in today. Findings were that my desk is too small, the chair lacks proper adjustments, and the board issued 14-inch laptops are not suitable for my needs. In order to be compliant, the HR rep is getting another new chair, a flat screen monitor, a keyboard and mouse, and even a desk that can be adjusted for sitting and standing. The principal had to sit there with a face like fizz while HR outlined all the reasons why my workstation setup wasn't HS compliant. Chair not HS compliant? Well, what about everything else? No idea how much it'll cost. The principal is a notorious tight ass. She'll be regretting getting in between a man's butt and comfort. Wow, all because they didn't let you have your chair? That's so funny. Surely they can at least be like, ah, well, I definitely brought this on myself. Like, surely they can see that that's a funny situation. Comical even. The next one is called The Car Is A Disgrace. I've been wanting to get this off my chest for years. Our company had a modest sedan that was provided to a co-worker and made to use as needed if we had a task in the field. I always kept it clean, whereas my co-worker would leave trash and personal items in it. One fateful day, the regional manager came to visit. The boss took him to a current project using the car. Needless to say, the car was a mess. I hadn't used it in over two weeks. Boss got an attitude with me because the car was filthy. I'm an engineer, not a car wash employee. He then put out a memo stating the car was a disgrace and henceforth it'll be kept clean and anything not belonging in the car needed to be thrown away before it was returned. The tone that he took was insulting and demeaning. The next time I used the car was a week or so later after the boss had used it. When I was getting in to return it, I noticed a set of keys barely visible between the seat back and the seat. I retrieved it and I realized it was my boss's key ring. In the many years that have passed since, I've come to feel that it was wrong to toss the keys in the trash. I can 
confess, that was childish of me. Still, part of me is glad that I did it. I was wondering where this was going. You chucked out their keys. This comment. You're an engineer, not lost and found. That's a really funny comment. But yeah, how bloody unprofessional of the boss. Like, you're upset at the wrong guy, buddy. Yeah, so frustrating. The next one is called Do Nothing All Night for a Ton of Overtime. Yeah, why not? A little bit of backstory. I worked at the time in an oil change place. They'd recently moved managers from salary to hourly because some managers in different cities were just lying and not going to work while getting the same check every payday. And I warned them that if anything, my pay was going to go up because I'm here a lot more than 40 hours a week. They were good with that, they said. Well, one night I get a call at 7pm, two hours after close, from one of my guys who was in the shop after hours without permission and crashed into a bay door, like a garage door. All auto shops have at least a few. He got fired. That's not the malicious compliance at all, just the setup. So I came in and investigated. The most relevant fact here was that he bent the door so there was a maybe 4 inch by 4 inch gap. A house cat could have squeezed through. I called our door repair guys immediately. They said their folks were on an emergency after hours call already to somewhere 5 hours away and they could be there in the morning. I said okay since this wasn't a danger. The door was in a place not visible from the street. You'd have to be behind our building looking for this kind of thing to find it. Alarm still set. Motion detectors still work. Anyone that broke in through this metal door with a 4 inch gap would have needed tools and was going to get in even without the gap. We didn't even keep more than a few hundred bucks cash around and anything expensive to steal was equipment bolted to the floor. Deal with it tomorrow, right? Obviously, no. I called my boss to fill him in and he said to call the door guys. I told him I did already and I tried to explain the situation. He interrupted and told me in super rude and loud words, this ding dong head did not like being called after work or having to do any work whatsoever. Told me just to call them and not to bother him again about it and then texted me rudely to say that I better damn well stay there until they arrive and finish the repair. So, since I was single, I had no plans and I was now paid hourly. I clocked in the instant I arrived initially. I decided this sounded like easy money. I pulled up two comfy office chairs to make a bed and a couch and I watched YouTube and I did assorted internet scrolling. Slept at normal times pretty comfortably all the way till 8am. They showed up around 9 and they fixed the problem pretty fast. I was already on my regularly scheduled 8 to 5 shift that day, which I finished. So now let's do the math. That overnight waiting, 7pm to 8am, 13 hours, all overtime at time and a half. And then my normal shift, 9 hours all at time and a half. So 22 hours by 1.5 is 33 hours of pay for doing my normal shift and just internet scrolling and napping that was barely even an inconvenience. My boss sees it come payday and tries to give me a yelling over email for trying to rip off the company, CCing all the big bosses and HR and payroll, etc. I reply to all, explain the situation, including the tech screenshot. Suddenly, I'm not the one getting yelled at anymore and I got every bit of that overtime pay. Yeah, and fair enough as well. Like, yeah, you're gonna be super rude for no reason. Well, it's gonna cost the company. The next one is called transfer me to anyone else. Whatever you say, ma'am. During the summer of 2020, I worked customer service for an online retailer. It's the worst job I've ever worked. While most people were polite, kind and understanding, I had to deal with a lot of people who were often justifiably upset about a problem with their order. But even then, most people would be sure to say their anger was not directed towards me. Faking sympathy for these people was hard enough, but then there'd be people berating me personally as if I had something to do with whatever problem they were complaining about. One day, the system that we used to track people's orders was down. I wouldn't be able to cancel orders, check when the shipping date was, or change the shipping address, nothing. The supervisor told us to tell the customers to call back in an hour, at which point the system would hopefully be back up. Again, most people were understanding that there was literally nothing I could do to modify their orders and said they'd call back later. This one lady calls me and is super upset about something and wants me to cancel her order. I tell her I apologize for the inconvenience but I can't at the moment and that she should call back in an hour. She was not happy with the response. She starts going off about how that's unacceptable. She doesn't have time later. Take down her information and do it later once the system is back up. That this is horrible customer service etc. I constantly have calls coming in so I can't be dealing with her problem at the same time as speaking to another customer. And more importantly my shift was about to be finished in 20 minutes and I sure as hell wasn't waiting around for the system to be back up and doing overtime to cancel this lady's order, especially with her rude entitled attitude. Eventually she decides that she's had enough of me and asked to speak to my supervisor. Summer of 2020 is peak COVID, so I was working from home. I explain the situation and I say I can't just pass the phone to my supervisor, but what I can do is escalate the issue by putting in a ticket and a supervisor will call them back in 24 to 48 hours. Of course, this is not good enough for her. She's yelling at me at this point, going on and on about 
how awful this customer service is and she's not accepting that there's nothing I can do at the moment. She decides she doesn't want to speak to me anymore and screeches at me to just transfer me to anyone else. I don't want to speak to you anymore. I say, okay, just give me a moment. As I'm thinking in my head, you did say anyone. I transferred her to Spanish customer service. Oh my God, that's so funny. I want to know what their reaction was when they got transferred. Judging from the rest of this call, probably pretty upset, I feel like. This has been such a fun episode, guys. I hope you've enjoyed. I feel like we should read one more. The next one says, employer only paid us on time if we faxed our timesheets. This happened about 10 years ago when I was working on the railways near London. I worked for an agency which supplied staff to the railways on a temporary basis. They were very old fashioned and as part of our employment contract, they stated that our hand completed timesheets had to be faxed by 7pm on the Thursday for us to be paid on the Friday. Timesheets that were emailed even before 7pm would result in wages not being paid until the following Friday. Obviously they chose the most inconvenient way as it was 2014 and nobody had a fax machine so that they were able to legally retain our wages in their account for an extra week. But my printer at home had a fax machine built in that I never used. So after my first week I plugged in my printer to the phone line, faxed my timesheet to the agency and waited. The next day I still hadn't been paid. So I phoned them and I asked them why I hadn't been paid. But the response was explained in a dull voice by somebody who had obviously repeated the same sentence so many times that it had lost all meaning to her. As explained in your contract, only timesheets that have been faxed to us are paid the next day. If you've emailed it, your wages will be paid the following week. But I did fax it. She gathered her thoughts for a moment before replying. Oh, uh, okay. Which number did you fax it to? So I gave her the number I faxed it to, which was correct. Um, okay. I'll just place you on hold. She came back on the phone a couple of minutes later. Okay, yes, we've got it. Sorry, I can't remember the last time somebody actually faxed their timesheet to us. I'll get that paid now. As you can imagine, I told my colleagues the following day and from then on, they all gave their timesheets to me to fax when I got home so they got paid on time. At the time, I wondered if they'd drop the silly fax rule, but it continued so every week I'd fax in half a dozen timesheets to them. That's so awesome. And yeah, you are probably one of the only people who's ever done it. That's such a sneaky thing from the company. Yeah, that's so silly and so interesting. My boss insisted that I work in the office today. My boss and I had a disagreement about working from home this week. The office is in San Francisco. I live in the East Bay and I need to cross the Bay Bridge to get to work. We had an important presentation scheduled today. I wanted to do it virtual because the APEC meeting is in San Francisco this week and everything seems disrupted. President Biden and Chinese President Xi are here. It's a two hour commute on a typical day and I told my boss it might not even be feasible to come in this week. He insisted I come in so I said okay but don't blame me if I get stuck in traffic. We had a pretty heated discussion about it. So today there's a huge backup on every freeway towards the Bay Bridge because protesters have chained themselves across all five lanes. The bridge is completely closed. Now the boss wants me to do the presentation virtual. But I told him I can't. I'm stuck in traffic. I can't operate my vehicle and do the presentation. You'll have to do it without me, but he isn't really qualified. Wow, so your boss didn't see that coming? That's so frustrating. Like, hey, I told you so. This is what I was trying to say was gonna happen. Yeah, that's super annoying. Like I said, this was gonna be an issue, and now it is. Story number two is called Take Notes of Everything You Say in the Meeting. Okay, but it'll get you fired. So, this happened a few years ago, and I will be vague since I'm still not sure if the dust is fully settled from the fiasco. At my former company, I was the secretary for a small improvement team that would meet monthly to discuss issues with the company and brainstorm ways to fix them. Something you need to know about me is that I was given this role because people know that I'm meticulous at keeping records records due to HR related issues I had at a previous place of employment. I don't think that my boss realized that this careful record keeping applied to her as well, especially when she appointed me to be secretary of this little committee. But I digress. I was a model employee, read award winning, and went above and beyond what was asked, as were many others in my department, but were still having customer complaints and dealt with regular safety issues due to the company at large and no fault of her own. When we brought these concerns to our boss's attention, emails were left unread, and during in person in exchanges we were called whiny, needy, and were told that we needed to just deal with it. Whatever the issue, from items being stolen by customers, to people being unhappy with the procedures the boss had set down for us to follow, it was always made to be somehow our fault. When we sought support from other departments, we were met with cold indifference, since the boss was great to them, and we must be exaggerating the things that she said to us. Well, during an improvement meeting at the end of the fiscal year, it all came to a head. Myself and a couple of my team members dug our heels in, and we were insistent 
and about the unresolved issues the boss refused to acknowledge, and she finally went off on us. She told us everyone was incompetent, didn't deserve our jobs, and that maybe customers would like us more if we were likable. When people pressed her on safety issues, she continued to reiterate that we just have to deal with it, and that if someone was going to die, they already would have right. I, as the secretary, did my duty, and I took notes of all that happened over the course of that meeting. I usually did bullet points, but that night I was feeling a little bit more thorough, so I wrote down words. Every hateful comment, denial of accountability, and idle threat was recorded in black and white. Now, a second part of my job was to distribute the notes from the improvement meeting to the rest of the company. So, come the next morning, I ran about 100 copies of the transcript of the meeting and hand-delivered them to every single department in the building, and things blew up. People from other departments who had attended the meeting were able to verify that everything I'd typed up had really been said, and folks were mad, threatening to quit, refusing to do their normal duties, browsing indeed during work, etc. My boss's boss, who worked at HQ, so I didn't get the opportunity to hand her a copy, got wind of these meetings minutes only a few hours after I'd handed them out and had an hour long, off the record conversation with me about all the safety issues I documented, all the concerns I'd submitted to management in writing, and all the records I had regarding my boss's inaction. She was so grateful for the hundred pages of documentation I sent over, and thanked me for my time. The day after I unleashed Pandora's box, I put in my two weeks notice, took a new job, and I pieced out to greener pastures. At first, it seemed like things were calming down after I left, but the following year, the company did not renew my boss's contract. I still feel a bit bad because I wasn't trying to get her fired or ruin her life. I was just desperate for some accountability thrown her way to create some sort of positive change in the company. But at the end of the day, I just did what she had asked me to do. Oh my god, that was incredible. Thank you for posting this. That was so fun to read. And yeah, don't feel bad about this. They had this coming. Their actions are what led to this. The top comment says, any boss shrugging off actual safety issues needs to be fired, preferably from a cannon. People don't understand why you're leaving early. I was working for a smallish company, about 60 employees across several locations, IT support for both hardware, laptops and phones, and software. When I was hired just under nine years ago, it was verbally agreed that instead of clocking any callouts as overtime, I would just take the time in lieu. Callouts were always minimal and there were never any issues with me taking the time here and there to make up for it. Any calls in the middle of the night were quickly resolved and I had no problem getting back to sleep. Appointments in the middle of the day were fine because of the additional hours from whenever. This worked well for almost my entire time there. I also always started early, just depending on when I left the house, got into the office and got my coffee. Could have been anywhere between 5 and 30 minutes because I would leave the house earlier so as to not wake the family if school was off that day. I didn't care at that point. It never bothered me. They got free time from me, but again, I did not care. Because honestly, what else did I have to do? It was a great job until it wasn't. One weekend, I was working on some hardware maintenance, cleaning up wiring, ethernet, plugs, and installing a new UPS. That took me the better part of a Sunday to complete, six to eight hours. This was understood, approved in advance, and appreciated. The following week, I decided to start burning those extra hours up. I still came in early, as I had done for years, but I started leaving an hour early from my regular end time every day if nothing was going on. This is important. If something needed to be done, I got it done. I was reachable via email until early evening and phone pretty much 24-7. This particular week was pretty slow, so I had nothing going on. I left an hour early for the first four days. On Friday, my boss comes up to me and gently says, People notice that you've been leaving early this week. I'd like you to make sure to stay in your office until the scheduled end of day in case somebody needs you. I explained to him that I was burning up loo days and he just reiterated that it looks bad to others. Seriously? You can't tell the others that I work my 40 hours a week, just not at the same time as them? Fine, cue the malicious compliance. I immediately submitted four hours of overtime for the hours that I didn't take in lieu. I still showed up at the office at whatever time I got there, but I didn't start any work until 8am. If asked, I would say sure, 8am start time. If I got called outside of office hours, depending on how long I spent on the issue, I logged it as overtime. User calls me at 7pm to ask a question. I answer him in 30 seconds, one hour of overtime. When my boss then started to ask, how come you're submitting all this overtime? I responded with a simple, some people don't understand or like me taking low time, so I need to claim it as overtime since I'm at my desk from 8 until 4. Because I wasn't available at his beck and call, it ended up costing them more money. 95% of my job could be done from home because of full remote access, but that stupid old school mentality means that the people in the office need to see you at your desk all day. I left the company very shortly after that for a much better paying job with full work from home. Know your worth? Yeah, 100% like this comment says. Good for you, doing things just because they look bad or look good is so dumb, and yet so many managers follow those rules 
course because they're too stupid to measure results in any other way. I did the same at a past job, except the other way around. I'd come in 30 to 40 minutes late. Not a morning person, but in exchange I'd stay until 7pm to finish all pending tasks and then lock up. Out of the blue I was reprimanded because being late is bad for optics and I needed to be in the office at the same time as everybody else. The shocked Pikachu face that my boss did when I returned the key and told them from today I'll be leaving at the same time as everybody else. Yeah and like this comment says, I had to deal with people noticing that I came in later than them. Must be nice leaving earlier than I do. Our department shift times aren't the same. She apparently never noticed that the production department was still cranking away when she walked through on the way to her car. But Sean noticed this coming in when she'd been at her desk for an hour. Yeah, I can't even imagine how frustrating that'd be. And yeah, good on you for getting out of there, OP. The next one is called Strong Arming Me Into a Viewing. Fine, but you won't get inside the apartment. I'm renting an apartment from a company whose renting agents are somehow all unprofessional and late and kinda slow. Had a plethora of issues with them during the 10 months, but that's a story for another time. As I've told my landlord that I'll be moving out, they instructed their agents to find a new tenant for the apartment. The way it worked was the agent would email me with a proposed date and time, and I would confirm that I'll be in at that time. I've got a cat, so I insisted on being present during the viewings. The agents never had keys. I think that's because the landlord's office is at the other end of the city, and they can't be bothered to drive an extra hour each time there's a viewing to pick the keys up, and then drop them off. So they relied on me to let them in each time. Apart from a couple of unannounced show-ups, followed by passive-aggressive emails about the messy property, all was well until about a week ago. The agent emails me saying they've got a viewing on the 13th. I respond saying I've got work that day and I won't be able to do the 13th. She simply replies, if you won't be able to accommodate this request, I'll ask the landlord for a 24-hour notice of entry, which is legally enforceable. Yeah, okay, do that. The day comes and I get a call. We're downstairs. Yeah, congratulations, but I'm not home. I hope you brought keys this time. Man, I wish I could have seen her face then. We went back and forth a bit. She tried to threaten legal action, to which I replied that I don't object to them entering. They're unable to enter through their own negligence and I have nothing to do with it. Naturally got an email from the landlord asking me to be more cooperative next time, which was ignored. God, I love these stories so much. You didn't do anything wrong. And like the top comment says, you were exactly as cooperative as you could be. You said that you weren't in. You said you couldn't be in. You agreed that with 24 hours notice, the landlord could require entry. That doesn't require you to be there to let them in. Yeah, why should it make your life harder because they can't organize? They just want you to do whatever they say. And good on you for not. The next one is called won't pay out my paid time off. Well, can I take paid time off and work? At my last job, I gave them notice and I'd assumed that they'd cut me a check for the 55 hours of paid time off I had left over. But no, they said I would lose it if I don't use it. So I went ahead and used my paid time off for the last 55 hours I was scheduled to work because I wasn't about to waste that. But then I remembered a few weeks back, I'd taken paid time off, but then I'd worked about 30 minutes into my paid time off. I ended up working time and a half, as with my paid time off plus 30 minutes of extra work. I enjoyed my co-workers. I wasn't working, so I sent an email to my manager. Hey Mark, I know we're a bit understaffed and I know I took paid time off already, but I wouldn't mind working anyway. Is that okay to work? Mark responds, yes, we'd be happy to have you. My hourly rate was $25 at that point. Time and a half put me at $37.50, which I was totally fine with earning. So come my second hour of Thursday, I'll be earning time and a half. So I worked, had fun. Come Monday after my last day, my old boss calls me and says, did you work 135 hours last pay period? No, I worked 80 hours and I used 55 hours of paid time off. Cause like your overtime pay put us over budget. I said, yeah, that sucks. You did say that I was good to work despite the fact I had scheduled pay time off, right? Him. Uh, I did. Yeah, thanks. He starts laughing. And yes, I got paid. The company now pays out pay time off when you quit because of me. In the end, they paid me $2,062 in overtime, plus the 80 hours I work earned me $2,000. So typically, 80 hours of work would cost them $2,000. But because they wouldn't pay me out my paid time off, they ended up paying double. When they could have just cut me a check for $1,375 and saved $700, essentially in their effort to rip me off my benefit, I made them pay $700 for their grade. I made sure to get permission to come to work, despite the fact that I'd already scheduled my paid time off. FYI, previously in another interaction, I was told that once paid time off was approved, it can't be cancelled. Edit, in my state, not paying out for paid time off is perfectly legal and fine. In my company, paid time off is treated in terms of paid the same as hours worked. So in a bi-weekly pay period, I'm scheduled to work 80 hours, 40 hours a week. I noticed if overtime pay went above 40 hours, I still got paid time and a half. So here's the math. I was supposed to work 80 hours. I had 55 hours of paid time off to use. So I took all of that, 
which means I was going to work 25 hours and take off 55. Now instead of taking those 55, I worked them, but I was still using my paid time off. So I got my $25 for my 80 hours and then I got $37.50 for my 55. This resulted in a gross pay of $4,062. Had the company simply wrote me a check for my paid time off, that would have been $13.75 plus my 80 hours would have been $2,000 for a total of $3,375. So the company basically paid me $700 more than they could have because they were trying to be greedy. Wow, interesting. So they still got work out of you, but they paid a lot more for it. The next one is called Comply with Bridezilla or Leave. Okay, my friend Gemma tells me about how she had an entire group of bridesmaids leave a wedding after their friend dared them to. So this all happened a few weeks ago. A longtime friend of Gemma's group was getting married in another state, but the day of the wedding, she suddenly had a problem with one of the girls who wore glasses, which she didn't have an issue about beforehand. The glasses girl told her she wouldn't wear them during the vows and pictures, but the bridezilla didn't want her wearing them at all, and was screaming at her to not put them on for the rest of the day. Obviously, she couldn't do that since she needs to see. The argument got even more heated until bridezilla gave the ultimatum to take them off and keep them off, or leave. This is when Gemma and the other bridesmaids stepped in, told bridezilla that she was out of line, and that they'd all leave if she forced the girl with the glasses to leave. Bridezilla called their bluff and being maids of honor, the bridesmaids left the wedding and decided to celebrate and eat at a restaurant before they head back home. Bridezilla called them several times after they left, telling them she didn't care about the glasses anymore and begged them to come back to the venue. But they not only refused, but they also chose to end the friendship with her altogether. Gemma said the wedding proceeded as follows, just minus the bridesmaids and a few awkward stares because everyone heard the bridezilla screaming from earlier. Gemma told me that the bride Godzilla has always been like this, throwing a tantrum when she doesn't get her way, and that the meltdown at the wedding was just the last straw for them. Personally, I think she's got a monk's patience if she put up with her for that long. Whoa, that's wild. At the wedding? Yeah, like this comment says, god damn, that's rough. I mean, it sounds like she deserved it, but imagine losing all your friends on a day where your life is already changing forever. Imagine the fiance being like, what the hell am I getting into? Yeah, that's unbelievable. And you're right, the husband would be like, oh, what? <laughs> What's going on? But I mean, if they weren't already going to be friends with them, why did they have to do this at their wedding? But yeah, like that comment says, I'm sure they did deserve it, but that's so rough. The next one is called, tell me to work when I'm not on the clock and just happen to be in the building. How about instead I organize the staff into a low-key resistance that lasts for years after I leave? This will be a rather basic one, but it still warms my heart. I used to work in a trade shop run by a great boss. Everyone got along great, except for one of the department heads. Let's call him. B. For reasons unrelated to this story, the boss decided to sell the shop to B. And in the wake, the majority of the staff quit within months, leaving us understaffed. I naively decided to stick it out, and I assumed that B would hire people to fill the empty positions. They didn't. We go from a 15-person trade shop down to a 5-person within a year, and that includes the 6 people who turned over. One of the many issues that developed, and there were many, was B's inability to schedule, or think through actions to the end, and plan ahead. While I worked there, the two years with the boss. I often came in 10 to 15 minutes early due to the nature of my commute. I'd come in, unload my stuff, make some coffee, small talk with my co-workers, talk to my boss, but we never really started work until everyone scheduled start time. When B took over, the moment you stepped into the stop, B immediately started to back orders at you regardless if you were in the building 15 or 20 minutes early. Mostly because B was in a rush to get something done they just remembered. When I, the now most senior person left at the shop from the old regime, would point out that we technically weren't on the clock yet for another the 15 to 20 minutes and I want to make some coffee, B would just snap at you telling you to do it now because so and so is coming right at opening. So I started to wait in my car, bring in my coffee from home and I'd only walk in the door as the last minute was changing. I was technically never late to work and I was ready to work the moment I stepped through the door. I don't know if B caught on but the rest of my staff did and followed suit since I told them to. For the remaining months I lasted there, all my co-workers would still often show up early to work but all waited in the vehicles. At some point one of them had a minivan and we all partied in there and then go in as a group. Anytime a new person joined, because someone walked off, we would also warn them of what had happened. It's been several years since I worked there. I don't know any of the current staff besides B. I happened to be doing an on-site install nearby at the time that the shop would open and I looked over into the parking lot in front of the shop. Like clockwork, a minute before the shop was scheduled to open, about six people got out of their vehicles and headed in. I may not work there, but it's nice to see that my resistance does still exist. Edit, updated B name. Edit number two, for those asking why I didn't just clock in early and get overtime, it's simply because I didn't want to. One, I deliberately arrived to work early so that I can get into the correct headspace to deal with B. 
cafe and I want to hang out with the staff for a few minutes before having to deal with the daily crap show and at that point I'd put an end to the 10 to 11 hour work days that I was putting in to deal with cleaning up B's mess. I was willing to help out since I felt bad that half of the staff left and they just needed the help. I also like money but after 6 plus months of the same mistake happening with no effort on B's part to even acknowledge there were issues, I burned out. So I informed B that I was only working 8 hour days, I will not come in early or stay late, I only lasted another few months before I found another shop. I'm a vindictive person and at that point I was enjoying watching the world burn around B. That's so funny that the employees still do this. So sue me? Really? This happened several years ago. I was working 40 hours a week programming at my main job, but I did occasional small projects in the evening and on weekends for other clients. At one point I was referred to a large company that runs major stadiums and event venues around the country. One of their stadiums is relatively close to where I live. I'll just call them Mark 1 for this story. The saga begins. This manager at Mark 1 said they wanted a simple administration database and user interface for employee timekeeping. Apparently the old system they had was not working for them. I got details of what they wanted and I drafted a set of specifications. I told them I could write the system to the specs for a $2,000 flat rate. They agreed. I immediately went to work and I churned out a database and a UI for the system with full documentation in about two weeks. So I scheduled an in-person meeting to show them. Now when I showed up at the meeting, someone representing the security department was there and he asked about getting some additional features. Sure, I told him I can do that. So I went back, wrote up a change request and incorporated the additional features into the platform. I scheduled another meeting with Mark 1 for a couple of days later. When I got to that meeting, I noticed the audience had grown. There were two extra people from the finance department. Can you add feature X and Y and Z? They asked. Yeah, sure, no problem. So I left, I wrote up a CR and I added the features. A few days later, I met with them again. Imagine my surprise when the audience size had grown and the new attendees were asking for more features. This went on for about five more rounds and I was getting frustrated that I'd spec'd out a two-week project that was now taking months and I wouldn't be paid until I delivered and they accepted the final product, but I chugged along implementing all their change requests. But one day, Mark 1 manager called me. Apparently, she'd been speaking with other departments that weren't representing in her status meetings of an ever-increasing mass. She gave me a list of dozens of new features they wanted, some of which would need a complete redesign of the core database and an overhaul of the UI. I'd had enough. I told her this is a complete overhaul of the original spec. I'll have to redesign and rebuild it from the ground up. Well, that's not my problem, she responded. Well, actually, it is. I'm not going to design and build an entirely new system until you pay me for the current one, built to the specs that we agreed on. After a short pause, she dropped a bomb on me. Well, we're not going to renegotiate. You can consider this project cancelled. That's not how this works. You still have to pay me for the work I've done. No, I don't. You haven't delivered anything. Sue me. And then she hung up. I'm so excited for this. They're going to sue them, aren't they? Cue the malicious compliance. Meet me at the courthouse. I took their advice and I went to the courthouse the next day to file in small claims court to recover two grand from Mark 1. On my court date a couple of months later, I went down to the courthouse and I was greeted by an arbitrator. In my state, they have court-appointed arbitrators meet the litigants when they arrive to see if the parties can sort out the case with an agreement to minimize the judge's time. The arbitrator asked me, is there anything you'd agree to to resolve this immediately? I thought about it and I said, if they'll pay me 90%, 1800 right now, I'll drop the suit. He then went into a side room where the Mark 1 manager and the corporate lawyer were hanging out. I heard her screaming that they would either pay it all or pay zero. The arbitrator came to me with the news and I told him, I heard and I'm happy to take it all. He laughed and said, no, they want to go to the trial. Fast forward a couple of hours and we're standing in front of the judge. I'm at my table alone and the Mark 1 manager and lawyer are standing at the opposite table. The judge asked Mark 1's manager to tell her side first. She went into a very long speech about the project and corporate America and apple pie and thermonuclear weapons. <laughs> and honestly, I have no idea because I stopped listening about 28 minutes ago. She talked non-stop for at least 30 minutes. Then the judge asked me for my story. Now, I wasn't maliciously ignoring the manager's long-winded tale of political intrigue and patriotism. I was actually formulating a strategy. I thought to myself, the judge probably had people who like to speechify in front of him all day, every day. I also thought he might appreciate a short and sweet story that got straight to the point and didn't waste his time. So I said, Your Honor, they agreed to pay me two grand to design and build a software system for them. I completed the work based on the agreed specs and then they decided to cancel 
cancel the project after I was done. That was it. Then the judge asked me, how do I know you did the work? I'd printed out the specs and the change requests and the documentation and source code the night before. I lifted a ream of paper, 500 pages from the table and I offered it to the bailiff. Here's the code I wrote for them, your honor. The bailiff came to take it from me and the judge waved him off. No need, I can see it from here. The judge then asked the manager, is this true? She looked like she was in a daze. Uh, yeah. Then I fined for the plaintiff in the amount of $2,000. F you, pay me. About a month later, Mark 1 still hadn't paid. So I called the county sheriff and explained. Sent him the court judgment documents and he said, no problem, they'll pay. The sheriff actually called me later that day. He was on a cell phone and I could hear him talking to the Mark 1 manager. He told her, cut a check for two grand right now or he was going to rip your computers out of the wall and auction them off until the judgment is satisfied. I don't know if he had that authority, but the sheriff seemed to have a grudge against Mark 1 and he was reveling in the opportunity to dog him out. Apparently Mark 1 believed he had the authority because long story short, the sheriff had a $2,000 check in his hand about 15 minutes later and it was in my mailbox about a week later. Wow, how frustrating. They should be ashamed as well. That's such an a-hole move. Like, oh yeah, we're going to agree to a price and a project and they do it and they still don't pay them and you thought you were going to get away with it? No. I'm so happy OP went through with this. Months of work for nothing. Yeah, nah, get out of here with that. The next one is called Tell Us The Right Time. For many years, my family would take trips with other family members. All of these trips had one thing in common. My aunt, uncle and cousins would be late for everything. This used to really irritate my parents who are pretty punctual and a lot more kids to organize. Four of us compared to my two cousins. By mutual agreement, any other family involved in these outings decided to go along with my parents and give my aunt and uncle the wrong time. For example, if an event started at 11 a.m., they'd be told 10 a.m. This was pretty effective until aunt and uncle started realizing they were being given the wrong time. I believe other family members explained why that was and they were fed up with always waiting on them or being late. Self-awareness not being very apparent that they were the issue. It was decided by them that it wasn't their fault and they told my parents, give us the right time from now on and you'll see. We aren't the problem. My parents, especially my mum, hates the idea of people missing out on something, but he's also prepared to let a natural consequence occur if it's not too harsh. The very next week, we had a day trip booked on the ferry. This was something we did once a year over to the UK and back in one day. Fondly known as a booze cruise back in the day due to the opportunity to purchase cheap alcohol, kids would explore the ship and when we docked, raid the pick and mix in Woolworths and buy confection that we couldn't get at home. It was something that everyone looked forward to a lot. What can I say? It was the early 90s. With the best will in the world, the ferry waits for no man. So it was a sad day for four people who were told the ferry left at 8am sharp, the correct time, and who arrived after 8.30 to see a small ferry shaped speck in the distance heading towards the UK. Sadly, it didn't make them any more punctual after that, but they were always told the correct time as requested and if they were ever late, we didn't wait anymore. For months, whenever we'd see them after that, my parents used to cheerily wave and say, very nice to see you. Oh, that's so wholesome. That's such a cute malicious compliance story. But so they weren't late if you told them to come an hour early. But if you didn't do that, they were late every single time. I don't understand how they didn't think they were the issue. Like they said, we aren't the problem. How do they not realize that they're the problem if they're always late? And also, if you're going to catch a ferry or do something like that, it's so stupid to be late. Because yeah, like in this situation, you'll miss it. The next one is called It's Us or Grad School. I used to work for a company that advertises knights, horses, and real weapons. If you know, you know. I was a follow spot operator. Pretty much you point the big light at the horsey man to highlight them. The company didn't seem to like hiring extra people for that position. And in hindsight, the turnover rate was pretty high, plus the pay was $10 an hour. During my work there, I'd had major surgery, which took me out for two months, which meant quitting and then hiring back. That never seemed to be an issue. A few months after that, I developed a pre-septic bacterial infection to a mild form of sepsis. My fever was 103 and my heart rate kept going up. I was sick. This necessitated me being out for a week. However, for some reason, I had to miss an extra night of work and I forgot to call in, mainly because my medication knocked me out. This was my bad. Again, important. At the same time, I'd been accepted into graduate school and had a class that met one Saturday a month. I was called into my boss's office to discuss the no call, no show. The conversation went like this. Manager, hey, OP, you did a no call, no show. That's pretty bad. Me, I'm sorry. I sent you an email and a doctor's note after as soon as I could. I understand this is an issue though. Manager, well, you've been written up for it, but that's not what concerned me enough to call you in today. Me, oh, manager, you're asking for a Saturday off every month. That's our highest attendance day. We can't do that. Me. I thought with enough advance notice you could schedule around me. Manager. See, that's just the problem. We've had to constantly leave
lean into your needs and now it's time for you to consider our needs and your team's needs me what are you saying manager it's either us or your class me i need the class for the full-time attendance i can't drop it manager smugly well i guess we'll see where we are in two months me okay i left his office and i told my co-workers i liked goodbye and then i clocked out he comes storming out to my truck and screaming at me asking how i could quit on him like that i told him he wanted me to choose between grad school or this rinky dink job and i made my decision i then took off the costume belt and i handed it to him saying i'd bring the rest back when i had time a week later i got my first real stage hand job that paid 20 an hour so yeah f you dude i have a master's now and i'm set to start teaching at colleges this semester and i'm a pro stage hand never give your employees crappy ultimatums oh that's so satisfying i love that so much like yeah being all smug get out of here oh okay i should leave i'm going to okay you can keep your job that i don't even want to be at hell yeah op the next one is called colleague thinks she's the big boss but the actual boss said no overtime no matter what edited to remove abbreviations thank you so much by the way this happened a few years ago i was working for a company doing special projects that had to do with building certain products one friday evening i get a call from the cfo this guy never called me before i didn't even know he had my number he liked playing art project management sometimes he tells me there's been a huge mess up in a project i asked him if it was a project i was involved in no no it had nothing to do with me and they desperately needed people to come in on saturday and sunday to work because this project needs to be delivered to the customer on monday morning and would i be able to go i say sure in this company any work on saturday and sunday was overtime from the first minute and the overtime rate was very good he told me i'd be joined by five of my colleagues almost all of them a delight to work with and one more person that's also a colleague but has all the information regarding the project so she would quote unquote lead it and tell us what's needed to be done let's call her wannabe genius boss lady in a cynical way of course she's not in any way shape or form a genius or genius in short everybody working on this project has at least three years experience in the company some have more than 10 years so there wasn't any need for a babysitter this fact matters for the whole story saturday morning rolls around and i get to location we all meet and have some coffee and homemade cookies that my wife made for us genius comes in asking us to gather around and explains that the project was done wrong from the get-go the company spent hundreds of man hours on it and it was all done wrong and we five have to in two days work not only disassemble everything that was done but redo it from scratch in the correct manner which not only involved putting it back together but also refabricating parts that were done wrong then she goes on to say in these exact words i'm the boss you do what i say i have the schematics in my head if you don't know something ask me and i'll tell you how to do it we all look at each other with a puzzled look and we just shrug our shoulders then she quickly and i mean quickly lay down some rules that she wants us to follow stupid things that just interfere with our jobs but no one actually caught all of them so we start working like i said we're all experienced we work in another facility that the company owns and we're brought especially to fix this facility's mess up all through the job genius does nothing except get in our way asking stupid questions drinking coffee taking smoking breaks treating people badly and making up stupid rules as she goes at some point the cfo comes in and starts talking to me and in the conversation he says these words no matter what no one works overtime no more than 12 hours a day no matter what because it's a saturday the rules allow us to work up to 12 hours but any more than that and the company can get fined genius promised the cfo that the job will be done no matter what within those two days of 12 hours saturday's work is done after 12 hours we all say goodbye and we leave coming back the next day we get to work again with her making the atmosphere worse and worse by the minute not trusting us when we say we're gonna do something hovering over us and generally being a nuisance as the day goes on we can see that we're not gonna make it on time we try to tell her that but she's adamant that this will be done on time i try to explain to her a few times that saying how much work there is and her insisting that we do not use automated tools it's not even possible to finish this in the five or six hours we have left there was a lot more crap that she pulled but i won't name all of it to save time on this already long story and maybe try to keep a bit of anonymity just in case someone recognizes the story she won't hear it she says the job will be done i'm like whatever dude i'm just gonna do what i can since you won't listen one hour before the end of the day comes around we've all been working for 11 hours genius finally realizes this isn't gonna work she calls her real project manager her friend and starts talking to him i hear her talking on the phone and she's blaming us for not working fast enough or whatever and tells him she promised the cfo to have this done i'm assuming she was betting on riding this success into a promotion or something and she doesn't know what to do then she walks out of the building and continues talking out of earshot after a few minutes of conversation she comes back in all guns blazing telling us to round up again so she can talk to us with fire in her eyes she goes okay you points at a guy don't leave until points at one part 
part of the project isn't done. Yu points at me, don't leave until that, another part is done, and continues doing this until she counted off everybody, and then she walks off, I'm assuming for a coffee or a smoke break or whatever. Cue malicious compliance, exactly 12 hours after arriving we all put down our tools and started heading out the door. She's shocked, asking us where are you going? We all say, we're going home, we've been here for 12 hours. She says, I told you that none of you leave until your parts are finished and tested, to which we reply, no more than 12 hours no matter what, and we leave. Later on I found out that she stayed by herself until 4 in the morning to finish it all by herself. She couldn't do it and had to go home as well. Her project manager friend came in on the morning to help her finish the job. The project was late. The customer came in to pick it up and wasn't happy to see it still not packaged and ready to go. Just as a side note, with the exception of Genius, I've known each of the people working on this project for a few years. All of them would have gladly stayed longer to help finish the project. They've done so many times in the past when called upon. If she didn't treat us so bad, we made sure to make management aware of this and she was never given another opportunity to manage anything. Wow, that's incredible. And also very frustrating. I can't even imagine having to work with somebody like this, like just giving you guys orders and acting like they're better than you as well. Like that's probably the worst way to lead a team. And yeah, as it should, it backfired on them. The next one is called relocate our office space. See how that works out for you. This one is a small victory, but it was super satisfying for me. So I wanted to share. I worked for a large international accounting firm with offices all over the country. Our boss, Karen, was well liked until she became the boss. A smiling assassin type who only cared about her position and looking good in front of the higher ups. All about the numbers, even if what we had to do to get those numbers didn't make any sense. So here's the story. My team, about 12, were primarily based in the London office, but once a week, per my contract and everybody else's, were required to work in a remote office a long way away from London. This place was miserable. A building in the middle of nowhere, one tiny corner shop for snacks next to a motorway. The closest place to eat was a 15 minute drive away. We all hated it, but hey ho, it was only once a week. Anyway, when our boss got promoted, her sole life mission was to cut costs. Everything from stopping overtime to telling us we had no stationary budget for pens and had to take from other team stores to allowing only one meal on social drinks and making comments at the meal when someone chose theirs to be more expensive. Example, are you really choosing that? It's expensive. I'm not sure we're gonna have enough budget. This is considering all other teams went for large fancy dinners all the time, unlimited drinks, etc. At one point she decided that the miserable location should be our primary office and she wanted us all to go there four days a week instead of one. All but one of our team were living in London. This meant for me a two and a half hour journey one way instead of one hour. After a few months, this really took its toll. The assistant manager, a friend of mine, told me that she said in passing to him that this office was less of a cost on our team budget than the London office. Yeah, what a shock. I decided to speak to HR and see what my options are. Maybe get an exception. Well, turns out we had a policy that anything over your normal travel hours to the closest office location to your home could be used as your working hours, aka the extra one and a half hours each way would be considered working hours. So I could arrive at 10.30 instead of 9 and leave at 4 instead of 5.30. Also, if trains and things were delayed or cancelled, that would also be included in the working hours. This happened often as this place was in the middle of nowhere. Infrequent trains, so I'd often arrive at 11.30. I forwarded the emails with HR to her and I explained how I would be complying with this policy. She agreed, but tried in a meeting to tell me this was an exception for me and to not tell anybody else. Well, I told everyone else and we all began complying with the policy. This meant that we spent less time in the office and productivity dwindled. She mentioned this a lot in meetings. I would often respectfully point out that it didn't make sense to force us to travel to this office and it affects everything. I was the main one speaking up about it. At some point, maybe a few months later, she told me I could go to five days in the London office. But again, this was a special arrangement for me and that she appreciated me and was making accommodations only for me. She also said that I'd tell everyone I had special circumstances that allowed me this arrangement and to keep our conversation confidential. I honestly think she just got fed up with me pointing out how our productivity is lower only because she made us travel there four days a week. Of course I complied, but the team noticed I wasn't with them and let's just say, it caused a bit of a riot. I didn't say anything, but they figured it out themselves. No special circumstances here. Slowly but surely one after the other, my colleagues started joining me in London, getting their own special arrangements with her. At some point, the majority were in London. Eventually, it was just her and the only other local colleague at this office while we were in London. We all had a good chuckle about it when she'd cave. It took a good few weeks. Then we got the email that our permanent location going forward would be London, five days a week, and the one local employee to that terrible office would work from home and come in once a month. It may have happened anyway, but I'd like to think that me speaking to HR and finding that policy at least 
just had a hand in getting us moved back to London. As for Karen, I could go on about so many stories with her, but I did eventually leave for other reasons directly related to her. Unfortunately, she is still in the same position at the company. I do, however, enjoy seeing her checking my LinkedIn profile from time to time and hopefully noticing that since I've left, I've gone from a junior to the same position as her. Yeah, like the top comment says, that's what happens when manglement uses the calculator before using brains. Yeah, wow, these have all been so fun to read. I feel like it's a good time to read something wholesome though. I hope you enjoyed that episode, guys. My dad installed a hot tub for his birds and when we turned it on, word spread pretty fast that this is the new bestest of favoritest hangout spot of all. Oh, that's so beautiful. Everybody showed up. Like, hey guys, I know a place to hang out and they're all bringing their friends with them. I couldn't choose between a star or an angel, so I went with both. Oh, that's so beautiful. I need to do this with photos of the cats. Beautiful little puppy dog. Me in front of grandpa. Yeah, orange juice is kind of nice. Next time when I go to grandpa's place. Oh, that's so cute. Like, hey, I got that thing that you like. I didn't realize how true that is. Like what, you like something? Okay, I'll buy it every time I go to the grocery store. Look at her in her jumper. Oh, so beautiful. I feel like we might have read this one before, but like, does it really matter? Look at that beautiful cat. And on that beautiful note, that's enough for today. Thank you for watching, everybody. I hope you had a wonderful time and if you did and you want to see more episodes like this make sure you like and subscribe and speaking of cats the comment of the day today goes to dragon seeker i love seeing your cats i vote that we have a permanent cat picture segment at the end of videos that's such a good idea so at the end of videos when we do the comment of the day and stuff we have like a recent cat photo segment or something that's such a good idea i'll put some photos on the screen right now of the recent cat photos that i've taken which are pretty much the only sort of photos that i do take so yeah hell yeah dragon seeker if i have new photos of the cats i'll put them in and thank you for the idea i feel like that would make the videos genuinely better and yeah guys thank you for all your support it means so much to me and as always make sure you look after yourself and make sure you have a beautiful amazing rest of your day and you know what i'm about to say because i say it every single day bye